we're going to keep talking about Ukraine here, but this is, you know, a little bit more in relation to Russia, talks and, and potential conflict. And now the U.S., the state, De- uh, the Department of Defense, actually, I think uh, John Kirby, the the um, spokesperson for the State Department, actually issued this warning that Russia was uh, looking at operations to carry out a false flag in eastern Ukraine to manufacture a pretext for invasion. And, you, you know, this is an interesting statement. Now, in one sense, if you're the United States, you put this out, it's kind of a way to prime the American people for the narrative that if anything bad happens in eastern Ukraine, it wasn't the terrorists that America has spent the past seven years training by the CIA paramilitaries, but it, it, you know, it was the Russians doing it to themselves to generate an excuse to go in. And so, you know, that, that was kind of my first skeptical thought I had in mind is, boy, the, you know, this statement really primes the American people to blame Russia for anything that happens coming up in Ukraine. And so there was actually a pretty large, I guess, cyber attack. I, I mean, you know, I guess large is by the, the standard point out by the media. So may put a question mark by that. But um, I say it was a, a pretty large cyber attack that hit a lot of Ukrainian government websites uh, on Friday. Now, I believe most everything is up and running back again and everything like that. Uh, the U.S. offered support to figure out, you know, who did it, but also to replace, I guess, anything uh, that was damaged, broken, or, you know, whatever improvements need to be made to security to ensure that this doesn't happen again. Uh, at the time I'm recording this show, uh, the U.S., Ukraine, nobody has pointed the finger at anyone for carrying this out. And I guess I should mention at the same time that while th- this hack was going on, uh, the Russian um, FSB, that's their intelligence service, uh, issued a report that they had taken down the hacker group. Uh, it's a hacker group or a ransomware crime group. Uh, I re evil, I guess, reveal maybe it's R E in capital V I L lowercase. Um, and that was at the request of the United States. This is the group that the United States blames for carrying out the uh col- colonial, uh, I think, pipeline hack. I think that was the name of it. it was six months or so, there's a pipeline that was hacked and everything like that. Uh, the FSB says that they searched 25 addresses detaining 14 people, uh, listing ad sets including 426 million rubles, uh, $600,000, 500,000 euros, computer equipment, and 20 luxury cars. <laughs> Certainly a lot of money, uh, a lot of cash, I guess, if that's the way it was. Maybe they took it from bank accounts, though, uh, that if that's the case, that that was a, a lot of money that they seized. Uh, the United says, States said that, you know, they were happy that Russia did this. And so I guess if you attribute the Ukraine hat to Russia, the Russia taking down this hacker group maybe doesn't necessarily make sense. If the hack on Ukraine wasn't necessarily from Russia now, it could have been done by separatists in eastern Ukraine who, you know, do are supported by Russia and everything like that. But at the same time, probably don't do everything at the orders of Vladimir Putin, have their own, you know, hostilities and reasons to lash out against the Ukrainian government without, you know, Russia supporting it all the time. You know, there, there's private groups that could have done. There's a lot of question marks on who could have carried out this. Also, you know, the, the possibility of a false flag going the other way or something like that, right? The, the CIA or CIA bat group carries out this ta- uh, uh, cyber attack as pretext to, like, then carry out some kind of offensive cyber operation against Russia or something like that. But, um, yeah, that that's part of the worry here. Although, you know, it could be a sign of good news here, too, that this is another overture that we're seeing from Russia to the United States. They're carrying out a a legal request at at behest of the United States, showing that the two countries could work together. This kind of thing uh, can be very important if the U.S. chooses to receive that message. Unfortunately, I think the uh, reveal, uh, you know, arrest will get buried in favor of the Ukrainian cyber attack. And so, um, 
few more stories on Ukraine here. Uh, the Ukraine, this from Ben Freeman at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Ukraine launched lobbying blitz ahead of pipeline vote, and he details how Ukraine spent well over a million dollars in 2021. Uh, let's see, nine. Uh, that money went to nine different firms. Uh, York Town Solutions got over a million. Uh, the the two people that I could find who work for York Town Solutions uh, also work for the Atlantic Council and German Marshall Fund. Um, there was Carvar uh, Communications got one hundred and twenty thousand, and then Arten. Bots got 300,000, and, and those were kind of the big names. Now, I believe it was uh, the one of the people from Your Town Solutions was also a former advisor and worked on campaigns for Ted Cruz, who w- was the senator that was really pushing for and doing everything he can to get a vote on sanctioning Russia over the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And so... You know, there, there's been different proposals on this for some time. Uh, typically, the, the threat from the United States has been we'll sanction Russia over the Nord Stream 2 pipeline if Russia goes ahead and invades Ukraine. And this bill would just go would sanction Russia as is uh, over the Nord Stream 2 pipeline and anybody who's helping Russia. So, you know, the, this pipeline is going to bring natural, natural gas from Russia into Central Europe. And so we are also threatening here uh, to sanction U.S. allies if they would continue to support the building construction of and then eventually, you know, the, the flow of, of natural gas through this pipeline. Uh, we talked about this on the last show, uh, not the last show, the 213 with Connor Freeman. Um, and on that show, we, we explained, you know, how uh, Rand Paul pointed out that this was probably largely based in some mercantilism and all that. But it, it also seems like maybe it has some cronyism involved, too, as, you know, this firm is getting a million dollars from the Ukrainian government. By the way, this is a country that the, says it needs military aid from the United States. Right. So it has plenty of money to pay our senators to, you know, write bills to send the Ukrainians more money, but it doesn't have money to just buy their own military equipment. You know, this is the level of cronyism uh, that, that we're discussing here. And so, um, yeah, so Cruz proposed this bill that was sanctioned uh, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, and it failed 55 to 44. It needed 60 votes, so it was five votes short, even though it did have a majority in the Senate. Uh, I believe six Democrats voted for it. Rand Paul was the Republican that voted no, and good to see that this got voted down. However, I think part of the reason that it got voted down was because the day before, Democrats unveiled a bill that would... uh, issue heavy sanctions on Russia should Russia invade Ukraine. And these included sanctions on the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, but also on Vladimir Putin and kicking Russia out of SWIFT. Uh, this would be a, a, a like a full-on almost embargo of Russia if the U.S. were actually to, to try to implement what is in this bill uh, if it ends up passing. So I think part of the reason that this bill ends up getting proposed is for the Democrats to undermine the the Ted Cruz bill because the Ted Cruz bill cuts against the Biden foreign policy. And I'll talk a little bit more about the reason why in a second. Now, I find the Democratic bill extremely problematic anyways and almost more of a threat than the Ted Cruz bill because uh, that was a little bit more partisan and it it seemed ridiculous. Like it seemed very unlikely to pass a bill that was going to harm the president's foreign policy as much as Ted Cruz's did. But this, uh, This bill is like an authorization for economic warfare, where essentially you're giving the president the ability to turn on a full-scale economic war against Russia at any time, 
And the the problem that I have is, you know, the, the trigger for the sanctions in the bill is a Russian invasion of Ukraine, which, you know, if we look at it and, and Russia actually goes in and invades Ukraine, as I, I've talked about on the show in the past, I think they fully expect to be heavily sanctioned. And so it actually isn't that much of a deter- deterrent or threat on Russia. However, this is just going to sit around and by the, the foreign policy establishment, they've already said that Russia has invaded Ukraine, you know, that, that Russia has and moves, you know, more forces into Eastern Ukraine uh, to, to bat the separatists there and everything like that. And so um, I, I think the real danger here is, is that this is setting up a scenario that any president who wants to now has the authorization to instantly open an economic war with uh, with Russia over Ukraine. Now, the Germans, a key U.S. ally in all this, and of course, through the four years of the Trump administration, we can't believe how he treats our NATO allies and Angela Merkel and the, all this kind of stuff. Well, now, Russia, or Germany really wants to get uh, natural gas through the Nord Stream 2 pipeline because it's really going to bring down energy prices and be huge for Central Europe. And they're saying, look, don't drive the Nord Stream 2 pipeline into the Ukraine conflict. And so this is what Biden is dealing with. If he sanctions Russia over Nord Stream 2, it's going to piss the hell off of our German allies, right? They they don't want any of this. This is the, the U.S. sanctioning the Nord Stream 2 pipeline would be taking the side of the Ukra- the corrupt Ukrainian government over the side of the, the NATO allied German government. It, absolutely unbelievable. But that's what uh, so many members of Congress want. That's what uh, I guess the administration is just unwilling to do. But I think would kind of prefer to sanction the Nord Stream 2 pipeline, but again, it would just create too many problems with Germany for them to do so. All right, so let's talk about the the talks a little bit that happened. Uh, we already broke down the talks directly between uh, the U.S. and Russia. That was uh, the U.S. Under Secretary of State Wendy Sherman uh, talking with the Russian, I think, Deputy Foreign Minister, and they, they spoke for eight hours. Nothing came of the talks. Uh, the U.S. proposed. Uh, potentially an INF light deal, uh, talked about missile deployments, maybe scaling back war games in Eastern Europe. Uh, Russia w- was really concerned about the, um, the, 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 you know, Ukraine issue, particularly uh, the NATO issue. And so those talks happened, but then we also had talks on the 13th or the 12th, that is, uh, Wednesday between that is uh, Russia and NATO. I think this was the first me- uh, meeting of the Russia NATO Council since 2019. So, you know, in that way, these talks were significant. They lasted four hours. Uh, but much like the uh, talks between uh, Sherman and Russia and Vienna, the- these talks really seem to have not netted anything. Now, you know, tots are tots and that, you know, even if the first round doesn't really generate any results, it doesn't mean that the two sides don't go back to their, uh, re- you know, respective countries. They say, oh, you know, we could actually work on this. And this is an, an area that something can be done uh, productively. Also, we don't know everything that came up in the tots. And so, you know, maybe Sherman really said like, hey, if you guys take down this uh, this hacker group, this ransomware group, then that's going to open up uh, some room for the U.S. to negotiate on other issues. And, you know, maybe part of what's happening, you know, now actually between Russia and the U.S. does have something to do with with the tots and we just don't know about it publicly but at least from what we know publicly it doesn't seem like very much of anything has come from them um russia are post tots it seems that nato said that the two sides should keep talking and russia just really kind of said that there's no grounds for future tots unless the u.s uh, is willing to show some flexibility and i think they're mainly talking about and around uh the the ukraine issue and this was a statement by the deputy foreign minister uh sergey robkov and so 
doesn't seem like maybe things are going to progress in the right direction, but doesn't mean that the U.S. won't, you know, send through some bad channels or give Russian some, Russia some sort of sign that, yeah, you know, maybe we are willing to talk on the Ukraine issue. So that's that's why I have on the talks that happened this past week. Again, two rounds of talk, one between the U.S. and Russia, one between U.S., NATO and Russia. No agreements, nothing major. U.S. made some proposals that, you know, maybe if they were made five, six years ago would have been far more substantial. But now where uh, the U.S. is in including and treating Ukraine almost as a NATO member, you know, giving it weapons, saying we're going to defend Ukraine's sovereignty all the time, all these training programs going on with Ukrainian forces. I think Russia is looking for a far stronger guarantee than just not putting uh, weapons uh, more like Patriot missiles or something like that into Ukraine and really looking for a, a more substantial guarantee on Ukrainian and Georgian also uh, NATO membership. All right, a few more stories on, uh, you know, the U.S., Russia, and the new Cold War to mention here. The Baltic states uh, were in talks with NATO to increase the number of troops on their soil. So this would be Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania. And you, this uh, bad news if it's happening because this is counter to, you know, what, what should be happening at the talks, which is the, the two sides moving troops away from their borders, not towards uh, each other's borders. Uh, Jade Sullivan says the chance of a Russian invasion of Ukraine is high. And of course, the uh, administration is in complete spin mode that this is all Russians fault. They even have Victoria Newland of all people, you know, one of the key figures in kicking off and creating this crisis. Now we could go back to 2008, Dick Cheney, George Bush, and, and those neocon boys all deciding that they're going to put Ukraine and Georgia on a NATO, uh, NATO plan of action, uh, membership plan of action, right? You know, that's, that's a lot of the roots of this, but also that 2014 coup was also very, very key in that. And so the fact that Victoria Newland is out there running around blaming Russia for everything it is very uh, concerning. Learning. And I, I don't think that, you know, uh, some kind of limited Russian military intervention in Ukraine uh, isn't completely unlikely, but I, I don't know if I agree with Sullivan that the chances of an actual invasion are high. Uh, Russia also just threw this out. Uh, this again, uh, Sergei Robkov, uh, Dave DeCamp writes this off at antiwar.com. Russian official doesn't rule out sending military uh, to Cuba and Venezuela. And in a way, this seems to maybe be uh, Russia trying to, and, you know, Jade Sullivan d dismissed this as a bluster, which uh, I, I think in some sense it is, because I don't think Russia is going to put like a major military deployment in, in, in Cuba and like create like a Cuban missile crisis or in Venezuela. And, you know, those two Latin American countries may not want to have quite such a large uh, NATO bullseye drawn on them if that, that sort of thing would happen. Uh, but th this may be a Russian attempt to try to get the United States to understand why putting troops in, you know, the, the other country's sphere of influence is so intolerable and, and maybe trying to, you know, if we put some troops in Cuba, then, you know, we could remove a thousand troops from Cuba and the U.S. could remove a thousand troops from Poland or Estonia or something like that. Last up, uh, the Russian-led uh, security bloc, these are the troops from the Collective Security Treaty Organization, CSTO. Uh, this Dave DeCamp wrote up uh, on the 13th at antiwar.com that they were beginning to leave. As of uh, the, the 15th of January, I read this morning, it was being reported widely in media, that that withdrawal of 2,000 troops from Kazakhstan has been complete. Now, with that, I, I guess I'm somewhat skeptical that, like, did maybe 10, 20 or a small number of Russian troops, like, hang around Kazakhstan, either in what they call a training mission, an advising mission, or maybe to guard just some, like, really key assets or something. Something like that's possible. If, you know, a, a few pictures of Russian troops turns up in Kazakhstan in the coming weeks or months, I won't be entirely surprised, but it, it doesn't seem like they, they kept, like, an occupation force or all 2,000 troops in a good 
majority, if not all the Russian troops are now out of Kazakhstan. And funny because, you know, in the U.S., of course, just three days ago was warning Kazakhstan that you'll never get them to leave. All right. 